Hey everybody, welcome back to D and J's Epic Quest. I am Justin or Soft Pillows, and this is This is Derek or Bird That Steals. I feel like we need to switch up our intro. Like how? Should I go first next time? Maybe. Maybe. Just throw a little spice at it. I don't yeah, I don't know. But it's also kind of like the fundamental intro. And it's not like I use the same intro from a different, the same intro on every freaking intro in the series. So it works. Yeah. They're never exactly the same. Uh, right. I mean, they're probably close. They're probably close. Oh, no. I use the same recording for like one episode on all the intros. I guess maybe it's oh. just because like <laughs> I'm, I, I am being that I edit these, I hear. And I listen to it in the car. I listen to it on the phone just to make sure that like audio levels sound fine. And I hear the intro probably a thousand times. So I'm just like in tune to, to how it sounds is maybe where, where, where I'm coming from with that. I got you. Yeah. Well, we find a way to switch it up here. Spice it up a little bit. Like you said, next time. (laughs) Maybe I should drop the whole soft pillows act. I kind of like it. Yeah, I mean, I dig it too. It's uh, it's kind of cool to reference something from like one of the very first chapters in this book, and to just have it stick with you the whole time, kind of like a nickname, you know. And it's a, it's a funny one. Right, right. Um, kind of reminds me of the nickname I was given by a roommate. Um, he used to call me cushions. Really? Yeah. I, I don't remember ever hearing that story. Yeah, I know. I I feel like I. Yeah, I've had many nicknames, uh, in the past, all in good spirits, never really like demoralizing or demeaning or anything like that. But cushions was one of them. It just it never really, never, never really stuck. He huh. he tried to make it a thing, but it just, I don't know, didn't stick. Well, I've had some nicknames too. You could probably guess one of them. I remember it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and now it's just like if somebody said that to me, I'd be like, oh, you're really creative. How long did it take you to think of that? <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like uh, whenever I get the Christmas jokes, I'm like, hardy, har, har. <laughs> yeah, that's how it goes. It used to bother me, and now it's just like, I've only heard it like a billion times, so right. I'm glad you still think it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> Joke's on you because you can't come up with something better. Right, exactly. And you don't know that because you haven't heard it a million fucking times. <laughs> right. <laughs> but yeah, I guess. Well, how was uh, how was your your weekend weekend for when we last talked? Um, it was good. I know that we just talked like literally. What was it three or four days ago? Um, but uh, yeah, it was July 5th, wasn't it? Or was it July? Was it actually July 4th? I don't even remember. Oh no, it was the 5th. Yeah, it was the day after. Right. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, it's not been quite a week, but that's okay. We were a little behind last week, but holidays. Um, yeah, no, it was good. We, uh, we took the kids to, uh, just I know this is stupid, but a Walgreens down the street because we live we live on the corner of like three three cities. So from that Walgreens, you get to see three different fireworks shows. Um, oh. yeah. So that's just what we've been doing for the last couple of years. It's great. No mosquitoes, no traffic. Don't have to deal with other people. You know. So it was good. Um, I got, I got the, uh, PlayStation three up and running, uh, was able to get that replacement part, popped it in immediately worked after that. So I know that all of the manic taking apart that I did with the other, the other piece was just a bum, a bum piece of hardware. Yeah. Been doing more rocking out with guitar hero. Still suck ass. Well, when when you get good enough where you can flip it over and play left-handed. Oh, I'll never be that good. Absolutely not. 
maybe on easy. Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe on easy. But you know, I would like to um, sometime soon um, get a get a bunch of the uh, you know my buddies together, you and some of the other buddies that I have up here, and just get drunk and have a play Guitar Hero. Yeah, that'd be fun. Yeah, just see how bad we are and get drunk to it you know <laughs> so that would be fun but i don't know outside of that uh not not too much what about you buddy well uh, last week was pretty busy worked both jobs basically all week and then a full day saturday at my part-time job and then yesterday i went with my parents and saw my grandpa and basically had a 600 ish mile round trip road trip for the day dang uh how is it working a second job not too bad um i mean it's pretty relaxed it's i don't know i've never really worked like retail before it's you know I've, in high school i worked fast food but it's kind of different not having like i mean my, my job now it's like okay i, I know what i need to accomplish because if, if we don't we just get behind and this it's just kind of like more or less do whatever you want to an extent this is kind of foreign to me gotcha and you said you're working at the um, home depot yep yeah that's usually my hardware store of choice that's pretty much where i go for like 95 percent of the things that i need um yeah i was in there the other day looking for uh um like big electrical boxes, like the big metal, like 12 inches by 12 inches by like 12 inches deep metal box and the electrical boxes. Didn't see any, so I'll have to like go online. Yeah, I don't, I mean, I've only, I haven't been there that long, but I don't remember seeing anything that big. Yeah, it's kind of a, a special, a specialist thing. I, I, I saw that they had a lot of, you know, smaller electrical boxes, but I need a box that I can just shove a bunch of cables in that aren't won't or won't even be used. So, hmm. yeah. Well, should we start talking about this chapter? Let's do it. This is what uh chapter 16 of Gardens of the Moon. Yes, sir, episode 17. It's just crazy to think that we've been one doing this for dang near almost twenty episodes already, and two, when you think of chapter sixteen, you know, in most worlds, you're like, "Whoa, you're not very far," but in reality, we're 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 nearing up on the the end of this, like one hundred and eighty ish more pages, and then we're wrapping it up. Yeah, yeah, and I'm feeling like the itch just to keep reading, <laughs> but I'm. I'm being good and holding off on it. So, <laughs> yeah, it itch is like the best word uh, that you use to describe that because it's definitely an itch. Yeah, the only difference is I don't need to go see a doctor about a rash. Yeah, do you think that they have some type of malazan topical cream? Um, it would probably be made with dead bodies if they did. Yeah, probably. Pretty, probably. Dead body politics. <laughs> Might not be pretty. No, you'll have to tolan that up. <laughs> nice. I don't know. That doesn't make any damn sense, but I said it. I you got a chuckle. I'll take it. I'll take the chuckles. But yeah. Let's uh let's get into it. Do you want to read the epigraph? I am all ready for it. Sweet. Ready when you are. December knows the sorrows in our souls. He walks at the side of each mortal, a vessel of regret on the fires of vengeance. December knows the sorrows and would now share them with us all. The Lord of Tragedy. That's kind of dark. Yeah, and um, I don't. I want to say that this is maybe the first time where I've been like, now that it's been made aware to read it after the chapter, like I read it before and I read it after. I totally understand this epigraph. I would confidently say for the first time since reading this book. Well, you might have to talk about that then because that, 
to me, that one didn't quite hit home, I guess. Gotcha. Yeah, um, I can totally, hopefully I, I remember. If I don't, by the end of the episode, let me know. And then we can swing sure. back to that. All right. Well, we'll get going with the first section here. Sounds good. This was a, uh, yes, probably a medium length one, but Lauren made it back to camp and started to treat her wound. Though not a major wound, there was risk for infection. Ignoring tools, she set to work patching herself up. She reflected and realized that it had been a dumb idea to attack the travelers. Unnecessary. It seemed she had been too emotional lately. Too many ideas, too much had happened, too much of herself interfering with being adjunct. Not long ago, she would not have made these mistakes. Tool had given her too much to think about. She had left sorrow and regret some time ago, as they were mind killers, but these feelings were creeping back into her conscience. She clung to her title of adjunct to try and keep control. Control, she thought, is what the Empire wanted. That was the heart of everything, she thought. Every act and thought from the Empress was for control, even from the very first Empire to, to where the Talan IMS were now. She had let the boy, Crocus, live, to both their surprise. She could not know what her own actions or thoughts would be anymore. Tool notices she's been injured and helps her finish wrapping her wound and tells her the time has come. The opening to the tomb awaits. She follows, follows Tool to the opening. Tool tells Lauren to keep her sword sheath as it will buy a small amount of time for them to pursue their objective. It will slow the jacket's return to consciousness. As Tool opens the tomb, which was really well written, um, and I gave it like three words, Tool opened it. Lauren was nearly overpowered by the stench that emanated. As they went deeper, the air grew colder and the stench began to dissipate. The cold numbed Lorne. She saw symbols etched into the walls. Though familiar, she could not recognize them. Tool said his people had been here before and added their own wards in addition to those left by the Jaghut to hold the tyrant. Lorne asks what the big deal is. Tool says he believes he knows the name of the tyrant and they definitely shouldn't let that fucker out, but he is compelled. However, once the deed is done, Tool's obligation is fulfilled, and he will leave, and she is welcome to join him. Lauren is speechless, and Tool only asks her to consider it. He will search for the answer, and he will find it. Lauren nearly asks what question and answer he will look for, but stops herself and simply says to get on with what they need to do. Lauren asks how much time this will take, and almost excited Tool says time does not exist in the barrel. She rephrases her question to how much time will have passed when they return. Tool does not have an answer as he has never done this before. This section was great. I will 100% agree with how it was beautifully written. And yes, your five words to describe that beautiful, beautifully written um, scene uh, definitely does not do it justice. But... It is a summary. It was. It was. Yeah. It wasn't supposed to. I. You know. It's just, somebody who's read this. You know, read this chapter and is listening to us. I mean, they're gonna. It's gonna stick out. They're gonna remember. Oh, absolutely. but it was like it was one of those things that was almost cinematic. You know, in my mind, I could just the way it was written and described. I could like I could visualize it, and it was it was pretty cool. Yeah. What um, did you have a like a any type of cinematic scene that you found yourself referring to uh, when you were reading this? Or is it just kind of like a, a cinematic scene as you read it? A cinematic scene as I read it. Yeah, there wasn't, I guess I, I wasn't thinking of like, oh, this is kind of like this movie or whatever. It was just kind of like, okay, if this were a movie, I could, I could visualize this. Yeah, fair enough. I just, I, I guess I was similar, but I also, I found myself as stupid as this is going back to like Monsters Inc. when they get XL or XL or exiled. That's the word I'm looking for. Um, you know, and they meet the abominable snowman and 
it's just this dark cave and it's cold and i know it's kind of like a, a light-hearted movie and the abdominal snowman is pretty much making you know pea cones uh yellow snow cones so to speak but yeah i just that sense of like that frost that chilly that yeah it was cinematic is a, is the good way to describe it I guess like the, it's just kind of popping into my head now, but as they're walking through like the corridor and um, Lorna is seeing all these like symbols etched, it almost reminds me a little bit of like Alien vs Predator, the first one when they're going down and they're walking inside the pyramid and they're seeing all that shit. Yep, yep. Now that you're describing, yep, I totally see that. Like a little bit of similarity, you know. I not the same thing, but like kind of in that vein. Well, I guess I don't remember what year this book came out, or even when that movie came out. But I doubt that. You know, I, I would assume that it would just be coincidence. You know, um, this book came out in two thousand and. Well, that says in, in the book it says first edition July two thousand four. Got it. But it also says originally published in Great Britain in 2002. So but early I, 2000s. I had also heard, though, and I don't know how much this is true because I really haven't followed up on, on what I heard, but I had heard that Erickson had spent about eight years writing Gardens of the Moon. Um, so... I, I guess who who knows, right? Damn, so, I had not heard that. I don't I don't know where I heard that from. I'm pretty sure I probably read it on uh, Reddit, but huh. yeah, I mean, it's certainly possible. But I think that was that that's the best cinematic scene to describe what it is that we're read that we you know we read in this in this section. But yeah, and that's not like the opening, just like when they're going through the tunnel and stuff. But right. I don't know what I would I don't know what I would compare to like the tomb opening up, I guess. Yeah, that's a I guess I feel like in the grand scheme of things, that's like the lowest detail comparatively to you know the stuff that follows, you know. It's just like there's a sense of mystery and anticipation and you just kind of want to like unveil more. Like, what is it that they're going to eventually discover? Yeah, and I was kind of like, I was a little bummed we didn't get more. You know, it was it was kind of a cliffhanger a little bit right at the beginning of the chapter, which is odd. It's odd that now that you're pointing that out, I totally agree that this section was a bit disappointing because you know we're expecting to finally meet this jag hut tyrant like things have been building and tension has been uh, accumulating to this particular point and just to be left hanging like that i guess you put it you put it into words much better than i could form myself but i what yeah i agree i agree that there's a little bit of a a cliffhanger there yeah i was i was um kind of surprised to see how much lauren is struggling just like with her own thoughts and with herself you know we started to see that at least i kind of noticed it you know to creep up last chapter and it's really evolving and you know taking its own you know there's she got a lot of second guessing going on i think she does and I thought it was cool that some of the points that we brought up in the previous episodes, just all of the things that Tool has said, um, kind of ignorantly is probably not the right word, but, you know, he's oblivious to, you know, current situations, it seems. So I don't think that he's like telling Lorne about the Talans Amasa's past just because he wants to fuck with her head. You know, I think that he's just like, he seems just to be like, to be a very logical and direct character, but with the inability to deduce 
or take into account any outliers, but beyond or consequences of, of that talk, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. It, like it's almost just kind of maybe like aloof is the a, a good word for it. Right. Like, you know, yeah. shit, but it just, it, so he doesn't really have like a filter. Yeah. Aloof and filter, no filter. That's a good way to describe it. Yeah, I, I think, you know, we're seeing all this stuff and it's going to, I think, I still think we're going to see some sort of like a, an alliance shift. I, I don't know. If, I, I kind of get the feeling she's going to stab the empress in the back somehow. I get that feeling too. And to be honest, it's kind of like an ominous feeling because like the information is there. The like mixed feelings are apparent, but what seems to be Lauren's struggle is her as an adjunct and kind of like an extension of Empress Lucene and who Lauren is as a person. And I feel like the majority of this book, we see a lot of the extension of Empress Lucene adjunct Lauren, you know, but now as we're starting to dive and uncover more it's being revealed that lauren has a humanity side to her and we're starting to see some of that seep through the cracks of her profession you know relating to being at a job where like you i mean you enjoy it but it's just not you're not enjoying it at the same time. Like it's not something that you want to spend your time doing, you know? So like just kind of that conflict of like, well, this is my obligation. Like I, I need to work. I need to make money. But at the end of the day, this isn't enriching me. So that, that conflict there of, do I leave? Do I stay? I think that is kind of like similar to what Lauren may be feeling um, between how she feels given all of this new information from tool as well as like how that contradicts, you know, her being in the extension, her being essentially the adjunct to the empress. Yeah. It's uh she really seems to be torn in two and, but you know, we're seeing, seeing a conscious come through, you know, she's not soulless and, you know, completely heartless though. She's pretty cold. Right. And I mean, there are a lot of instances where Lauren, you know, uh, just the whole, you know, even in the last chapter, she doesn't really understand. Well, she doesn't understand, but she also acknowledges that attacking the group of dudes, Call and Marilio, Crocus and Krupp, was unnecessary like that that was something that she admitted to herself as being like well this that was really stupid to do and also that she doesn't she doesn't like to draw blood so i guess more my question is is was that was that interaction a one of those things that lauren had to quickly decide between being an adjunct and being lauren and in that particular interaction with Crocus and that group, did the adjunct side of her win? Because that seems to be maybe maybe more or less where where it went, just kind of subconsciously. Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I think you're right. You know, the adjunct side won out, but it wasn't without like a lot of thought and. And, you know, what she tried to leave behind, you know, the regret. It's like she regretted it. Right. Which, um, if you remember our epigraph, Decembre, right? He is like the Lord of Sorrow or Lord of Tragedy. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. So, to Lauren, this is a tragic event, right? I mean, unnecessarily tragic. She didn't need to do anything. In the last chapter, she admitted to herself in the moment 
while she was talking to Crocus that a simple conversation would have done as well. So that's kind of like the first instance. There's more, but that was kind of like the first instance where after reading the epigraph, after reading the chapter, I'm like, ah, yeah, that that makes sense. So I guess I could almost imagine, which brought some clarity to the epigraph particularly, where I could imagine this Lord of Tragedy, this Decembre, kind of walking along or, you know, ab like apparition type invisible walking along with Lorne feeding her this sorrow or this tragedy. It's, uh, it's an interesting thought, but I like it. Yeah. So I think that, yeah, I don't know why I have such a sense of, oh, that's so cool. But it was just nice <laughs> to be able to, to, to relate and look back at the, the epigraph and make ties to it because I feel like the epigraphs are definitely a, one of the more unique things that I've experienced in, in reading a book. Granted, I have not read a lot of them in the grand scheme of things. But I, I, and maybe most readers of Gardens of the Moon may not understand their purpose. And I truly believe they have a purpose. It's just breaking down and understanding that purpose and how it relates to the chapters is a little challenging. Yeah, I, yeah it certainly can be. I agree. But also, on top of Lorne having all of these regrets and kind of this you know, sway of conscience. So does Tool. Did you pick that up? Yeah. Yeah, because he's just like, uh, my obligation's filled, peace out, I'm done. Right, but even he mentions in the section, I feel like it's right after or before that part, where he's like, Lorne, I have, like, joined in the way that you've been feeling, you know, because I feel like, yeah, I feel like ever since they started traveling together, like Lauren has slowly changed. Like her character arc went from this cold adjunct to traveling with this amass who is, you know, unveiling loads and gobs of information. And now her having kind of like an inside access to the empire is able to make comparisons which has thus caused her character arc to change. And I, I, you know, I guess I don't give tool enough credit being able that he was, he was able to pick that up. He was able to pick up those emotions. Like I know there was a couple of chapters ago where he would picked up on her frown, how she was always frowning and kind of like asks her about, right. it, you know? So it's, I guess it was cool to, to hear or read rather that, tool more or less feels the same way that Lauren does and that's kind of guiding guiding his decision that like once this obligation is done like I'm out and I'm going to go seek answers which it is I can't think of the word but he leaves me with more questions like what answers what are you going to look for and I think that Lauren was going to question that but for whatever reason, decided not to ask about what answers Tool is looking for. So I hope we get to to see him continue as a, a character. I, I hope that it's not just release the Jack Hot Tire and he dies and then we never hear anything after that, you know? I don't really get that sense. I feel like he'll probably play some sort of role. I think so too. I just always think of both sides. Yeah, but I, I don't know what kind of role it'll be, but I guess we'll we'll see. So it kind of seems like Tool and Lorne are probably going to be successful in releasing this Jack Hut Tyrant. Would you Would you agree? Uh, unless I don't, something happens really quick. Yeah, it looks like they've kind of got it in the bag. Yeah, which also is making me itch to read on because, like, I want to see. I want to see what happens because 
this whole idea is just fucking stupid. Like, there's such a high probability that it's going to backfire. But they're going to do it anyways. Right. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Hmm. (laughs) Well, I don't know that I had anything else to add here. I feel like uh, I think that we did that that section justice. I feel like we hit on a lot of the points. And I guess to me, I don't think there's any amount of visual explanations that we could that we could describe to do that section justice. So um, definitely worth a couple of reads. For sure. But yeah, if you're ready, I'm ready. Yeah, take it away. Crocus is sweating. Not because the day was hot, because, but because there was a woman pressing against him as they rode. Crocus had a mix of feelings, as on one hand there was a woman who was near his age, and attractive at that, holding him tight. And on the other hand, this woman had murdered a man. And the only reason Crocus could think of for her to be in the hills was that she'd been planning to kill him. Little had been said between the two since leaving Call. The walls of Jerujistan lay about a day or so ahead. A thought occurred to Crocus on whether or not this girl would remember Jerujistan. A voice that sounded like Calls told Crocus to ask her. But before Crocus could ask, the girl asked if Hikito Khan was far from here. Crocus told her that he was unsure, and the girl asked about Jerujistan. And how excited she would be to be in a city as she's never been. The girl asks if his name is Crocus. Crocus is bewildered as to how she knows his name. But the girl reminds him that he had heard call call him that. A moment of silence passes between them. And the girl asks Crocus if he is going to ask for her name. Crocus asks if she can even remember it. She replies with no, she cannot. Crocus, Crocus, Crocus. Crocus snaps at her a little bit and tells her that he couldn't help her with that. The girl then asks for Crocus to give her a Jerujistan name, to which she quickly says Chalice. Crocus, Crocus quickly withdraws this as she cannot be Chalice because he already knows one. The girl asks, well, why not? Is she your girlfriend or something? Stopping the horse, Crocus tells her that no, she is not his girlfriend, and then dismounts the horse. He tells her that he would like to walk. She dismounts the horse and tells Crocus that she would also like to walk. Crocus makes a comment about running, and the girl rounds on him and asks him if he would run away from her. Crocus saw ruin in the back of her eyes and desperately wanted to know more but couldn't ask her directly. Crocus tells her sorry and that Chalice cannot be her name. The girl, with excitement, tells Crocus that sorry was her name. Sorry tells Crocus that it at least had been her name, not the one her father gave her, though. Crocus asks if she remembers that name, to which Sorry admits that she doesn't. They started walking, Sorry keeping stride with Crocus, Crocus shows Sari Lake Azure and that Darujistan was on the southern shore of Lake Azure. The girl complains about not having a name yet. Finally, Crocus comes up with Absalar, the Lady of Thebes. The girl likes this name. Absalar tells Crocus that she's tired and could they camp at the Catlin Bridge. Crocus says, sure. He's only got one bedroll, so she can have it while he stands watch. Absalar questions this, to which Crocus asks why she has so many damn questions. Crocus begins to ramble on about dangers and calls wound and the garrison on the other side of the bridge. Absalar elbows him in the ribs while laughing and tells him to lighten up and that they can share the bedroll. Rubbing his ribs, Crocus could only stare at her. So I feel like they're flirting a bit, or at least Crocus is. I feel like definitely attracted to Sari, but also irritated with her at the same time. Yes, there, I definitely got that sense that he is kind of annoyed. You know, it was, it's like a, you know, it's like a eighth grade like guy thinks this girl's cute type deal. You know, like just 
puppy love type deal. Right, or like infatuation. Yeah, that's probably that's a better word. Yeah. I um I just I just thought this this the dynamic between them two the the, the two of them were in, was interesting. Uh because you know, I, I, I guess I just get the sense that, like, sorry, or sorry, Absalar. See, I'm going to have to, like, re- rework my brain to call her Absalar now. And we still don't even know her fucking real name. Um, that she's just kind of this, like, annoying little sister, you know, is kind of where, like, my mind was going with this. Just like, when do I get a name? When are you going to give me a name? Give me a name. I want a name. Give it, give it, give it, give it, you know? <laughs> right. Yeah, I follow that. Makes, it, it did feel that way. And I guess I maybe have a theory about Crocus. And I know that, like, we've described him as being a whiny bitch <laughs> in some instances. But he seems really, like like, testy. A lot. And I don't know when I was thinking about it, but I had this thought, like, if if Opan is actively influencing Crocus's mind or thoughts and actions, like, wouldn't you be a little frustrated by that, too? Like, wouldn't you be a little irritable, more irritable than if you didn't have a god influencing your mind? So... Um... Yeah, probably. I would be irritated. Right. So, and I I don't think that it was her question that made him angry or as to why he snapped at her, but rather the situation around her not even knowing her name, that had set him off and made him upset. Because I know that after she had said that she doesn't know her own name, like the way that she had said it kind of like instantly calmed Crocus down being like recognizing that it's not really her fault and that she's maybe just looking for some piece of identity, right? Like she's essentially been blacked out this whole time, maybe seeing or viewing tidbits of things here and there, but I guess that's just where I'm going with it. It's probably been like a, a dream, kind of, you know. She's it probably feels like she's sleeping, and she kind of probably remembers some of this stuff, you know. And now that she's her normal self, it's, you know, like what was I doing? You know, like I killed people. Like that would kind of be a shocker to like find out. And I, I don't think she's got that info yet. But no, yeah, I think that is going to come too. Is I didn't even think about that scenario. Like what happens when she finds out? Um the people she's killed. Yeah. I, I think it'll, I mean, it mess you up, right? Like, especially if you don't know you did it. Yeah. And just being told this, like, I would probably be like, you gotta be kidding me right now. Right? Like, there's no way that I did that. <laughs> and everyone's going to tell me, yeah, no, no, you, 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 you totally like went to town on some dude's testicles with your knives. You know, right? But, yeah, it'd be a shocker. It'd mess you up a little bit. Yeah, I wonder how she's gonna deal with that, or even if that situation will happen. Yeah, maybe it won't. Yeah, but I mean, like, I feel like the only the only people that would know that she's killed is her. But hopefully, that's something that Mammoth maybe digs out. Um. I'm assuming that's what's going to happen. Is they're going to get her to Mammoth, and she's and he's going to do some some mind probing. Yeah, I could see that. I guess outside of you know the irritating flirtatious pair here, what did you think of Absalar um, being her name for now? Well, that was the goddess of like thieves or whatever, right? Yeah, the Lady of Thieves is what they called it, but. I know Crocus mentioned that she is a goddess. I think it's an interesting choice, but I, I, I don't know really if it'll go anywhere or if it, you know, it's just, you know, I, I, I don't, is it going to stick? Yeah, I guess, 
I guess I, I feel the same way you do or similar maybe that I'm skeptical about how well this name is going to stick. Kind of like my cushions nickname. <laughs> that came around fast. Yeah, I had to. I, I couldn't sit on it anymore. Like you sit on a cushion? I am sitting on one, yeah. Yeah. The Vikings cushion. Yeah. That knows a little bit about disappointment. <laughs> You had to go there. Oh, fair enough. Good, good, good job, sir. I live here too. Yeah. Um, yes, we definitely know a lot about disappointment in that arena. But we're not here to talk about football. Bye bye. No, no, we're not. Um, I I thought her name was ironic. And the reason I say that it's ironic, Absal Absalar is the name is that of the Lady of Thebes or the Goddess of Thebes, right? But Sari or Absalar was the one who was taken. And now they're on their way to Crocus's uncle to see what they can find, what remains in her head, right? I just thought that her name now is the Lady of Thebes, but her journey so far has been stolen. If that makes sense. This is, yes. And I told you I had a crackpot theory and yeah. I'm not ready to talk about it yet, but you're kind of feeding into it. Ooh. Okay. So you remember it now? Well, I kind of remembered it, but I can't remember exactly where in, in the chapter it was. That's yeah. all. I mean, we could still talk about your crackpot theory. We just may not have any not yet. source stuff. God damn it. Okay. All right. I will wait a little bit longer. Because <laughs> I, I it, yeah, we'll, it'll come up somewhere. Okay. I just, I just thought that that was kind of cool. And maybe not everybody on their first read through or even their second may have picked that out. Or maybe I'm just with the vast majority and everyone's like, duh, Jaws 10. Duh. Like, come uh -huh. on. Anything uh, else we wanted to talk about here, or should we move on? I kind of hope they fuck. I just, they're like kids. I just, I don't see that. I, I've always viewed them as like, you know, early 20s, maybe late teens, you know? So, but, you know, even teenagers are doing the nasty these days, so... And I'm assuming that back then, which this seems like a very back then story, you know, people didn't live as long. No, people, yeah, it doesn't seem like they had uh, real long lifespans necessarily. No, but yeah, I guess that's my last thought. I, I guess I don't care if they do or don't, but, you know, I just, I've just got a feeling. That's it. All right. Well, maybe you'll be right. Maybe. With that being said, do you want to, if you don't have anything else, I think we could move on to the next section. Sure. All right. Krupp is bitching at Marilio about how slow his mule is. They're supposed to be guarding the boy because Baruch said so. Marilio says, Crocus is a big boy, and he can take care of himself, so what's the rush? Is it a favor to Mammoth? Why is Baruch so interested in Crocus? You tell us Baruch's orders, but don't explain them. Krupp, uh, excuse me. Krupp relents and says Open has chosen Crocus for whatever reason, so Baruch wants to keep an eye on him, and more importantly, keep any other powers from finding him. Marilio is mildly irritated and says he should have told them and is wondering if Ralic knows. No, Ralic doesn't know. He's too busy and that's why he's not with. Apparently, also Marilio knows more of what Ralic is doing than Krupp does. So why is he telling him this? Marilio does not understand. Krupp explains that what looks like a massive failure on their mission is actually a huge success. Marilio is still confused. 
Krupp says that the woman they ran into had no tatter of sword, so she's Malazan. Murillo kind of freaks out and says they're insane for leaving Cole behind, and they have to go back and get him. They can't leave him for a Malazan. Krupp tells him that he will heal soon enough to follow, and the need for speed is more important. Murillo says there's a Malazan in the Gadrobi Hills, and Krupp must have an idea why. Krupp has a hunch, yes. They're looking for the barrow of the Jagat. Even though they think it's a legend, the Malazan are looking for the truth in it and may actually succeed. With Tatteral swords and eye mass in the area, Murillo cut him off. Cole's all beat to hell. There's a Malazan killer and an eye mess. Oh, and our pet's heads are falling off. Krupp, you are insane. Krupp doesn't deny it, but he says he thought he'd be eager to get back to Darujistan. Murillo still ir- is still irritated and tells Krupp just to spit it out. Krupp tries to, play, tries to play dumb, but Murillo isn't having his bullshit. Krupp says he doesn't know whose idea it was to get Call back to his position, but all he can do is applaud. Murillo is shocked. How could he know? Krupp says none of that matters with all the danger Crocus is in and the girl was possessed. And if the girl was possessed like Call thinks, then that certainly is a scary thought. And what of the thousand other gods and demons that would stab open in the back? Would Murillo abandon his friend? Murillo says to shut the fuck up and ride. After an hour of riding, they make camp as they're both tired. Besides, Crocus and the girl won't make it into the city until sometime tomorrow. All I can think now is that scene where he's like, and our pet's heads are falling off. <laughs> it's one of my, like, when when things are going to shit, I always have to add that in. Like, this is going on. This is going on. Our pet's heads are falling off. Oh, God. This is such a good movie. I, uh, anytime, when I was younger, Anytime that I was having like a shitty day, uh, you know, this was back when you had to order DVDs from Netflix and I would just pop that movie in and just giggle at all of the stupidity that is that movie. I was hoping you were going to get it. Oh, I totally got it. It's my, one of my favorite movies, favorite movies. Love it. Good. But yeah, um, what an interesting dynamic uh, in the section between Marillion and Krupp. And yeah, think, there was definitely some frustrations there on kind of both sides. Right. Although I feel like Krupp is using, he's kind of like manipulating the situation a little bit, but to try to get Murillo to openly admit what him and Ralik are planning. Did you catch that? Or am I crazy? No, because, yeah, he's playing dumb with stuff. Like, obviously, he's, he knows more than he's letting on. Absolutely. But that's Krupp's MO. Plays dumb, but at the same time, like un you know, unwillingly, un you know, just witting outwits everybody to the point where they're like, just shut the fuck up, Krupp, you know. Right. Just just spit it out and let's move on here. Right. So I get where Call is frustrated because like it's just it's just disbelief after disbelief. Like you're telling me that our pets' heads are falling off, you know. Like as <laughs> as as they you know Krupp keeps talking, you know. So, but Krupp just playing smooth, calm, collected. Was like, nope, there are other matters at hand here. More important or like dire needs to to catch back up with Crocus and and the girl. Yeah, so you know, there wasn't a lot of, I guess, you know, this section was just kind of a conversation. There wasn't necessarily a lot that happened, just, you know, what was said. Yeah, but I mean, you've got, you've got conflicting, I mean, these, these two are, are pals or buddies, right? So, or friends, but you have this, like, you know, polarizing what's the word that I'm looking for motivations by each, right? Like Marillion really wants to go back and help call because he's essentially all by himself with all of this shit happening. 
But then Krupp, on the other hand, is like, no, that's not important right now. What is important is that we make sure Krakus is protected. Now, I don't know if that's just because, like, Baruch gave that order or if because that's, like, is he just filling an obligation because he was told to? Or does he truly believe it? Yeah, that I'm not sure. What do you think? I think that it's a little bit of both. I think that it's a little bit of both. Because, I mean, what do we know about Baruch? Right? He kind of seems to be the head honcho amongst magical beings in Jerugistan. Krupp, we know, can channel Warrens. So I guess as far as a hierarchy would go, I would put Krupp underneath Baruch. Even though even though Krupp doesn't really have any modesty and kind of often compares himself as being on par with Baruch, whether that's true or not, I, I guess I feel like all Krupp does is kind of talk truthful shit. Yeah, he does do that. I, I mean, it's just, it's almost like it's kind of hidden a little bit, though. Like He's trying not to give it away too much. Yeah, true. This section also, not as much as the previous section, this section kind of also reminds me of the epigraph a little bit because Call is, you know, obviously trying to go help Call in what I would consider kind of a a tragedy of a situation. You know, he's left all by himself with a wounded leg, defenseless, Right. So I feel like Decembre is also accompanying Marilio in this interaction as well. Yeah, he's uh we're kind of joking at the beginning of this, you know, the pirates code deal, you know, you fall behind, you get left behind, and he kind of got left behind because he was gonna slow him down, you know, and he didn't get left behind because he already fell behind. Exactly. So I just, it was cool to kind of see, it was kind of see like a more heated argument or debate, I guess you could, I would call it, it wasn't really an argument, but more just kind of like a, a debate of facts. Yeah, it was a little bit of a heated exchange. Yeah. So I'm just, I'm really enjoying a lot of these character dynamics where kind of in the beginning of the books like you're introduced to characters but you don't really you haven't really gotten a a taste of their personality yet you just get kind of like a a small sample based on their actions but it isn't until later in the book where you get a lot of these interactions between these characters that it it makes the reader more relatable to them in my opinion yeah and i wasn't sure like you know like krupp like, I don't know entirely how I feel about him. You know, I, I don't know how much I like him and how much I dislike him, but I definitely don't trust him a whole lot. Right, but at the same time, he makes sense. You know what I mean? Like, you don't want to trust him, but the things that he says... Like, I, I, I found myself aligning with him as much as I didn't want to in this section because Call will... He's, he'll be fine, you know? He's a big boy. He can handle himself. But also just the amount of potential issues with Opon occupying Krakus, gods, goddesses, demons, whoever would want to essentially take out Opon. I got more of a sense of urgency to align with Krupp, Krupp's logic, log, logic way of thinking than I did Marilio. I think that makes good sense. But also, you know, I mean, now that we're talking about it, isn't it, it, isn't it kind of interesting how, I guess, in this particular section, there could be a team Krupp and a team Marilio, uh, as far as readers go. There could be some out there who are aligning with Krupp. There could be out there who are, like, aligning with Marilio, as far as, like, what to do from, like, an ethical standpoint. Yeah, I could see it being split, for sure. <laughs> I feel like I'm probably more team Krupp, but I just, I'm hesitant. Right, because you want to not like him. You want to not, you know, you want to just discredit everything that he says. But 
I guess for me myself, I, I share that view with you. Like I don't, I don't trust him, but at the same time, he makes sense. Yeah. So it's, it, it feels kind of dangerous. Danger. Yeah. I see that. Uh, yeah, I guess that that's really all I had to comment on, on this section. I just, I really liked, really liked their interaction. It was fun to see some like frustration come out because I don't feel like we've had a ton of that. Not with this group. No. Right. And I mean, even as a whole, I don't feel like there's, you know, there's been some, but I don't feel like there's been like, you know, some that's been to this level. Right. Yeah. We, 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 I guess in the grand scheme of things, I would, I would associate, the irritability and the frust the frustration to kind of be like a middle of the road type emotions compared to what like we've seen or read so far, I would say. Is that kind of where maybe you're going? Yeah. I think we're kind of on the the same page. I like it. You cool if we turn the page? I am very cool, Mr. Metallica man. <laughs> Maybe that's not, or is that not Metallica? I don't know. Uh, I I don't or know. I want to say Bob Seger for some reason. Uh, yeah, that's not right. I I don't think that sounds more right than mine. Um, but yeah, I guess this is a another long <laughs> one. So forgive me. Um, uh, so take a quick swig of water. It came to Captain Paran that days after his encounter with the Tisiande and the events within the Lord's Sword, Rake had not suspected him to be a Malazan soldier or he would be dead. This led him on a trail of thoughts about the mercies he was shown. And was his luck really tied to his sword? His thoughts lingered on no longer being on the Empire's road, but focusing his energies on saving Whiskey Jack and Co., Paran's still inside his head thinks about morality and recalls some education he'd received while studying in Unta from the philosophers there. Paran's horse is riding on a trader track and Paran's thoughts go to a similar conversation he had had with Lorne. Lorne, essentially not wanting to hear it, put the kibosh on his thoughts of morality and the discussion around it. Paran finds himself wondering if Lorne could be so cynical and he could potentially understand why Empress Lucene was and at what cost was Lauren's cynicism an extension of the Empress. He remembers one moment where Lauren's mask had been removed as they looked upon a road covered in dead soldiers' bodies. Paran caught mo movement to the south and became aware of a rumbling sound. He rose in his saddle and could see a wall of dust. He darted westwards and observed the wall of dust there as well. He then trotted to the crest of a nearby hill and noticed the wall of dust surrounding him. He then goes back to the plain as the wall of dust further surrounds him. With no safety in sight, he simply waits. Within the dust, large silhouettes are seen, and Paran makes note that what he sees are Behedrin, Huge shaggy creatures that roam the rivy plain. He catches movement to his left, and something from his right hits him and knocks him off his mount. He hits the dirt hard. Wrestling with somebody, he drives his knee up and connects with a soft stomach. His attacker rolls onto his side. The captain found himself facing a youth with tanned hides. The boy sprang at Paran, to which he sidesteps and hits the boy on the head rendering him unconscious. Cries were heard from all sides, and the Behedrin were parting, were parting, and two figures approached to drag the unconscious boy away. Rivi, sworn enemies of the Malazan Empire and allies to Caladan brood in the Crimson Guard. Another warrior approached, standing an arm's length away, he reached for Paran's sword. Paran swats his hand away. This warrior makes a cry, and the two that had had, had 
had appeared before had returned. The warrior in the middle says something indistinct to Paran to the warrior on his left. This Rivi comes forward, and before Paran could react, Mortal Kombat leg sweeps Paran while throwing his full weight of his shoulder in Paran. Paran is on the ground, a knife cuts his helmet strap, and a fistful of Paran's hair is grabbed. Dying was one thing, but dying without dignity was another, and Paran wouldn't have it. So what does Paran do? The only thing available, and that's to grab a fistful of the man's testicles and fucking pull and twist. This warrior shrieks in pain, releasing Paran's hair. A knife flashes in Paran's face. Grasping the wrist that knife that held the knife, he uses his other hand to pull the testicles again. The shriek came again. Paran let go of the meat sack and turned around to hit the man in the face with an armored elbow. The warrior crumpled to the ground. A lance haft smacks Paran in the temple and another one to his hip. Something also pinned his left foot to the ground. Regaining his balance, he draws chance. The weapon was almost knocked from his hands a total of three times. After the last, he had not lost his grip on his sword. There was silence. Paran looks around and sees no one is moving. He then looks at his sword, seeing three iron lance heads sprouting from his blade. Paran observed the warrior with the smashed face laying motionless, and his pack horses had not moved. The rivi had pulled back, and the encirclement had divided, and a figure was walking through. A girl, no more than five years old, approached. Something was familiar about her, her way of walking, the stance she had before Paran, something in those heavy-lidded eyes. Paran was unable to keep his eyes from moving from the girl. A thought enters his head. Do I know you? Silence between them was held. An older woman came up behind that of the small girl and placed her hand on her shoulders. The small child speaks to the old woman, who then addresses Paran in Daru, telling him that five lances claimed an enemy here, but five lances were wrong. Paran tells her that they have more lances. The old Rivi acknowledges this, but the god favoring your sword has no followers here. Paran tells them, so finish it because he's tired of this game. The small girl speaks to the old woman, and the old woman kind of looks at her in surprise. The old Rivi addresses Paran. She tells him that he's Ma- he is Malazan, and the Malazan are chosen enemies of the Rivi. She asks Paran if this choice is his, and to be wary, because she can tell a lie. Paran says that he has no interest in calling the Rivi his enemy, and prefers to have no enemies at all. The older Rivi blinks and tells Paran that she has given him a gift and that he is to live. Paran didn't trust this turn of events and kind of disrespects the Rivi woman and the small Rivi child. The Rivi woman hardens and asks Paran if he's to hear the small child's words or not. Paran agrees to hear the words. The old woman, speaking on behalf of the child, tells Paran that even though they have never met, they do know each other, and that the child says that he doesn't need to grieve, as the woman he knows has not passed through the arching trees of death. Paran must be patient, as they will meet again. Paran is like, which woman? The Rivi responds by telling him the one that he thought dead. Paran's heart is pounding. As he looks at the small child, Staggering, he whispers, not possible. The girl withdrew, dust surrounding her, she disappears. Another cry calls out. Paran yells, wait, as the sound of thousands of hooves drown out his cry. He thinks to himself one single word, Tattersail. Grab his dick and twist it. Yay, nut twist. Good, oh God, okay. So... Have you ever seen the movie Teeth? Uh, is this the Vagina Teeth movie? I've heard of it, but not seen it. Vagina Dentata! Yeah, yeah, it's that movie. Heard of it, not seen it. Okay, well, um, damn it. I can't say what I'm going to say. I don't want to spoil the movie for you now. 
I'm probably never going to watch it, to be perfectly okay. honest. Well, um, basically, the vagina dentata girl has sex with a man and bites off his dick. Who could have saw that coming with a movie title like that? Right. But it just, that like, oh, you know, like as a dude, you're reading this section or watching that movie and you're like, you know, like you, you physically cringe up a bit. Like, that's exactly what I got when I was reading as Paran was grabbing this dude's nutsack and twisting. I don't think he twisted. I think I just threw that in there as a twist. I think he just pulls on him, but like, fuck. Yeah, the way it was written, though, I wasn't like, I kind of had to read it again a second time because I was like, is this what what I think happened? Yeah, so you're doing like a, a, a reading double take. Yes. Yes, very much. <laughs> yeah, I guess he's probably not going to have any children. Uh, that's probably not important. No, probably not. But I mean, ouch! I d- ugh. Yeah, it's not a pleasant feeling to take one in the balls in any uh, you know any way, shape, or form. Nope, nope, nope. I'm good. All of the, it just reminds me of back when, like, you know, I mean, kids are assholes, right? And they'd be all like, what's the capital of Thailand? Bangkok, you know? And <laughs> hit you in the balls, and you're like, you fucking asshole. Why? Um, I, I don't, I probably had some friends do that, like, in school and shit. It was just fucking annoying. Like, why are you hitting my balls? That hurts. It doesn't feel good, no. So I guess just like when I read that, you know, I recall a lot of times where I've been hit in the groin and it fucking hurts. Yeah, it sucks. Um, 100% would not recommend. No, definitely not recommend. But yeah. What did you think? Like, did you get uh, like Lion King vibes with this herd of beasts coming a little bit? I did, yeah, yeah, yeah. I imagine them as like buffalo, you know, the like the yeah. shaggy thing that they have at the top of their humps. Um, and I also thought what was cool that I didn't really summarize because it was already a long summary, but it sounds like the Rivi, Rivi, while they were like tossing lances at Paran, were standing on these uh, Bedarin. Behadarin. I I have no idea how to say that word. Maybe someone can correct me um, when they listen. But yeah, they're like surfing on these beasts. You know, is just kind of like the image that I got. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It kind of was. It just kind of. Maybe that's how they heard him. I guess I don't know. But it was. It definitely was a pretty intense passage for sure. That with uh, you know more more good visuals for sure. Yeah. So it was just, it was cool. I mean, I want to say that like my experience brought me to kind of like the Aiel in, I, in, you know, the wheel of time is, but not quite, you know, um, less red hair and blue eyes. Yeah. And I, I, for whatever reason, I kind of got like the feeling that these were the Rivi are smaller in stature. I I guess I didn't I I guess I didn't imagine their height. Was there something that like made you think they were smaller? Nothing in nothing in particular, I guess. I I don't know. Just uh, I guess just my own head canon interpretation, I suppose. Got it. I guess like when I think about it, I think of like maybe not necessarily tall or short, but like lanky, you know is what I get with like all of these like animal hides like hanging or drooping off of shoulders and arms and and things like that like wrapped around the waist things like that yeah but you know I thought it was interesting that um we get kind of like a recollection of events and this time it's from Paran's perspective with Ajak Morn overlooking the dead soldiers at Akito Khan. 
And he says that she kind of has a moment of, of softness. He doesn't really elaborate as to what specifically that was, but again, kind of going back to like the epilogue, uh, epigraph, sorry, with Decembre, like Paran is regretting what he may have said to make her snap out of whatever softness she had been showing at that moment in time. Because I know that like in his thoughts, which again, I didn't summarize that specifically what he was thinking outside of recalling that specific event on a larger scale, but he's kind of reminiscing and regretting whatever it is that he said, which he can't even specify either as he doesn't recall but something had snapped Lauren out of her softness and the mask that is what I would consider the adjunct mask came back on. So I, I don't know that I have anything to add to that, Justin. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's all good. It's all good. But um, I guess, yeah, I feel like we could talk about Lauren and her, her, you know, wish washiness, but maybe we should give it a rest because I don't know what else there is to really say about it, but it's just interesting. And, and, and again, I feel like you and I agree that it's leading towards something, but what that is, we'll just, I guess, have to keep reading, you know? Yeah. uh, Right. And obviously we will keep reading, but yeah, did you just think that Pran was just like an absolute badass? Oh yeah. In this. Oh yeah. But also, it you know how much of that is Opon and a sword? You know, it's like, yeah, it was such a badass scene. But how much of that is like Pran's handicap? I don't know if any of it was because, you know, at the end of the last chapter, you know he. You know, half of open went through the fucking portal to wherever. And, you know, he's like, well, I made, this was all my decision. I wasn't influenced in that type of thing. So I, I kind of still feel like he's on that. Like he's kind of doing his own thing now. He's going to be on his like revenge tour. Right. Yeah. Which I think is, is good for Paran. But also at the same time, he gets a little bit of closure at the end of the section. But Going back to your point, I could have swore that the twin didn't go through the the Bornin underneath that huge, large cart because he was just used as bait for the hounds, but was quickly moved out of the way when they like jumped. I I guess I was under the impression that they went through right before the hounds. Got it. Yeah. You, maybe we'll have to revisit that. Maybe. But that's what I could have swore that I, I I guess it imagined when I read that section, but I might be I might be overlooking a word or two. But um but we know that from Anamander Rake in the last section that Opan's definitely not dwelling in Paran, but it definitely is in the sword though. And all of the lances that were thrown or jabbed at Paran had hit his sword. And you have to remember that Paran in this moment, which I feel like this interaction was probably almost a page. So to us, it kind of seems like as, as readers a little slow, but to Paran, this is like within seconds, right? But like he gets smacked in the head with like the end of a lance and then he gets smacked in the hip. So somehow not going unconscious during that that period from the blow to the head or like impaled but rather being rather than being impaled he's pinned to the ground with a lance in his foot and then to be able to regain your composure quickly enough to block three lances either thrown or jab at you like i'm kind of not surprised that the Rivi are just standing around in astonishment. I don't doubt Paran's abilities or his skills. And I'm sure that like, that definitely doesn't, you know, doesn't take away from it, 
but how much of this is you know opon's luck in the sword i still just i don't i mean it's it certainly seems unlikely you know unless he's like fucking neo from the matrix but i personally i just feel like there's very little luck involved from open even though the you know at sorry go ahead what this is good i like it even, you know, even though he deflected all the lances and everything. Well, and and even the old Rivi woman makes a comment about how the a god favors his sword, but there are no followers of of that god among the Rivi. So I think that like they have one are you know astonished because they probably don't know what's going on, but at the same time, this old woman and this small child are clearly some type of leader amongst this particular group of Rivi. So they may be able to recognize that his sword is indeed favored by a god because, you know, she calls that out. Those are just the things that are contributing to why I think that it is definitely some skill on Paran's part, but he's definitely getting some assistance. I'm still gonna. <laughs> I'm gonna disagree, Justin. We're gonna disagree here. It doesn't happen often. Yes, it's happening. Okay, fair enough. Cool. Well, uh, do you wanna do you wanna elaborate? I would love to hear more of your thoughts along those lines. Uh, just you know, just how he keeps saying, you know, he's he's making his own decisions and he's not being played and. And maybe he is, maybe he's just naive to it, but that's just kind of my my thought right now. Kind of like a fuck whatever help I'm getting, like I'm just going to do this on my own. Right. I see where you're coming from, but I think that uh, hopefully more will be unveiled and we can revisit this disagreement. <laughs> But no, I think this is good. Maybe it'll, be, this is it'll be confirmed one way or the other. Right, right, right. I feel like for the most part on 90% of the things that we 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 agree on. So it's nice to have a little bit of a, a different perspective, I guess. I see where you're coming from. I could totally see it going down that way or that being the case. Yeah, that's just kind of kind of my thoughts on it. No, they're good thoughts. Um the other thing that I thought was crazy is it didn't really hit me the number of Rivi that were there until like the very last two sections of the sentence where literally it's described that as the sound of hundreds, if not thousands of hooves drown out his cry. But like to think about that, like, you know, when I first read this, I'm thinking, okay, yeah, he's surrounded. It's probably, you know, a group of maybe 30 or 50 people there. But to get this sense of scale this late in the game just kind of, like, makes you go back and recollect, like, holy fuck, like, how easy would it have been for them to not throw five but a thousand lances? Right, everybody just unloads on them. Right. So, I mean, I feel like they could have easily have overthrown Paran. But, you know, in the event that five lances were, were used and none of them killed him, was some type of sign or, you know, the, or just astonishment in general. Like, how the fuck did he avoid all that, you know? He's Neo. He's doing the bullet time back flex and all that. <laughs> yeah. But, hey. Tattersail, a girl, soft pillows. She's back. She's back. And she's older. <laughs> a little bit anyways. Yeah, I mean, I feel like only, I guess I can't say approximately how much time has passed, but I wouldn't say five years worth. I feel like no. the same year, maybe a couple of days since the events of her soul being transferred into a Rivi a woman's baby yeah it hasn't been too long yeah i 
I don't know why, but for whatever reason, I just thought that like Tattersail was out. Like we weren't going to see her for a long time. Like maybe something that would be used as a cliffhanger at the end, at, like at the end of the book or shortly into the beginning of the next one. I don't know why I had that in my head. It's just with the way that everything left off with Tattersail, it just, it concluded nicely. Like I didn't really have a ton of disappointment with that, that, st- that story with her. Yeah. But I know when, you know, we had, you know, when she was first reborn, I, I don't know. I mean, we had confirmation before, but I guess this just kind of confirms it to the other characters. Yeah. But that's all brings me to back to the next point, right? Like, if Paran is so like revenge sought, but now he's got closure to the fact that like Tattersail is alive, you know, like I feel like at the end of the chapter, he's recognizing that like that's still her, but you know, but in, in a state of disbelief. Yeah. I used <laughs> definitely shocked and surprised. Yeah. These last two chapters have been visually stunning and, absolutely a joy to read they have been and it 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 felt good to see like you know the that that confirmation i was talking about with tattersail come from like the point of view of another character and not because who was there it was krupp and then the the ruby mom mother and uh was it crawl uh it wasn't crone it was uh Crawl. Crawl. Yeah. Carol. And then. Cruel. Sorry. And then. Yes. Prod or Prawn or. Oh, yep. Some to right. land bone caster of the Cron clan. I can't remember his name. I feel like it starts with a P, though. Yeah, I think you're right. Not really that important, but just kind of got off on a tangent. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But crazy section. Crazy section, but I feel like that's all I really have to say about that. Okay, Forrest. Yeah, glad you caught that. Okay, well, we ready to go on here? I think so. All right, section five here. It took an hour for the herd to pass. His thoughts went to Tattersail and what she could have done. He remembered the small footprints with talk at the remnants of Bellardin and Tattersail. He wondered if she planned this. Why the Rivi, an already young child? Had she ascended? How old would she be when they next meet? Thinking again of the Rivi, they'd been driving the herd north, a herd big enough to feed an army. Caladan Brood is on his way to Pale. He thought one arm was in trouble. He had a couple hours until dark. Beyond the Gadrobi Hills was Lake Azur, and beyond that, Daruzistan, where Whiskey Jack and the squad waited. And the young woman he'd waited three years to meet. He wondered if the god possessing her was even his enemy anymore. He felt like he was a magnet to draw the ascendants, but he felt his cause was his own, not the adjuncts, empires, or anyone else's. He would ride forward towards anything that came his way. So that that's kind of, it was a little bit ahead, but that's kind of one of the reasons where I, you know, I just, I think it's, just Paran, you know, he's not having interference from open right now. Yeah. Yeah. I can see that. Maybe it's like more of like an indirect thing than a, where it was maybe more of a direct thing before, you know, where like maybe the twins were inhabiting Paran's body as well as his sword. And now they have left the body, but the luck is still within the sword. I mean, Anna Amanda Rake has said, you know, or told Paran that, you know, use that sword until luck runs out and then give it to your worst enemy, you know? So like, I don't know. I guess I just keep going back to like, there's a supernatural episode. I don't know if you've ever watched that show with, there's an episode with the lucky rabbit's foot and as if you lose this lucky rabbit's foot, your luck turns to the worst and you end up dying because 
something catastrophic happened. So I guess that's kind of what I'm associating with the sword, maybe, is that not necessarily that he loses the sword, but in the event that like maybe there's like an unlimited or not an unlimited, but like a limited amount of luck in the sword, but everything else is purely just Paran and his will to move forward. I could I think I could compromise on that. That yeah, they're gone, but there's still some luck in the sword. Yeah. I get down yeah. I can get down with that. Cool. I like that. I'll compromise there too. <laughs> Would uh, would you like to hear my crackpot theory now? Yes, finally. Okay. So it, I think if I'm remembering right, it was... I could have swore it was in this chat, it, in, in this section. I think it was in this section. But my crackpot theory is that Lorne is the older or adult sorry. What? What makes you think this? So there was, was it the last chapter where um, when they were fighting and uh, Sari was like trying to get closer to like, you know, she was hiding in the rocks to like watch and she was having a hard time gathering shadows. I don't know, something just, it, it popped. And I think it was the line when Paran is wondering if the God possessed singer was even his enemy i don't know why but which which was is the empress the the blue lady is she the one with the blue skin yeah okay so i'm safe on that front but that's my crackpot theory and i don't have a whole lot to back it up right now other than it's just kind of a feeling interesting i mean i guess i yeah i i mean we've, we've seen that time can be messed with in here True. In this world. So you think that Lauren and, is possessing Sari or was possessing Sari? No, I think I feel like this child that we don't know the name to eventually grows to be Lauren. Oh. So you think that like even though it's the same soul of Tattersick person. It like her name growing up begins Lauren. Yeah, I think this is just, you're, you've got the same person just at two different points of their life. Got it. So essentially, when Tattersail is a new cadre mage, and she goes into Mouse Quarter and ends up imprisoning Lauren's parents, she's essentially doing that to herself. Well, damn it. Sorry. To throw. <laughs> I told you it would probably be fairly easy to do. <laughs> to rebuttal? Man, you can't put that burden on me. I don't want to like, I like your crackpot theories. But I mean, I get it's possible, though. It's possible that it, it, it's pretty crackpot, right? I mean, it's pretty wild. It's pretty crazy. It is wild. I mean, it's no more crackpot than me believing Riga's still in sorry. But I've, eh. I've got a feeling that, you know, when I go back and reread this book, when we're on to the second one, that I'll be like, ah, oh, Justin, you're an idiot, you know? I don't think you're going to You'll be like, oh, I don't think you'll feel that way. But you'll just be like, uh, maybe I should have thought that differently or something. Right. Or like, I'll, you know, I mean, now that I'm familiar with the book and familiar with the characters going back and rereading, you know, I'm not reading for the first time. So it's not going to be like as jarring to me. Like I'm going to understand and comprehend a lot more and more quickly than I did when I first went through it, which is the beauty of this podcast because you know we learn as we go on and i'm sure that there's a ton more that we're either way off on or we've nailed just right etc etc but no i like that right. i like where you, i like where you're thinking i can i can see that i can see that happening so i don't think it's crackpot i think that it's pretty out in left field but definitely within the possible realm of possibility i guess we'll just have to definitely wait and see on that one and i don't know if anything will ever come of it but yeah but i think it's interesting that Perrin has or paran i don't know why i keep saying Perrin. paran has this thought about like he wonders if the god possessing sorry 
is, was even his enemy enemy anymore. But as we just read, the rope cotillion who was possessing sorry. I guess I don't know if he's really I don't think that he's a god. I think he's kind of like the the assassin or the right hand man of the god of Shadow Throne. Um so it, it's just it's it's kind of coincidental that he wonders this thought, but we know for sure as readers that sorry is sorry now or Absalar. Whoever she whatever her real name is, I guess. She's back to herself. Right. I just I wanna know what her real name is. I'm gonna call her Brittany. <laughs> She's gonna be Brittany. All right. Yeah. It's Brittany bitch. It's Brittany bitch. So you gonna have a uh, meltdown and shave your head? <laughs> yeah, I don't know about that one. Maybe, but yeah, I guess outside of those things, uh, I guess I don't, I don't know where the Rivi come into play as far as Caladan Brood's plan, because I don't think that in that chapter where he was talking with Crone that he really revealed that hand yet. So. I definitely think that Dujek's plan is is about to be thwarted a bit. Yeah, probably. I don't know. I guess it'd be kind of interesting to see how like feral and savage the Ruby are. They, they might be kind of bastards to fight. Yeah, I could see that. I could totally see them being difficult. Difficult, yes. Especially with their you know amounts of numbers and. I mean, the beasts that they're riding are are intimidating as fuck charging at you as it is. Yeah, are you going to stand in the way of those things? Because I probably would. Nope, GTFO. Yep. Exactly. But, yeah. I don't know if you're ready, but I'm cool to move on to this last section if you are. Yeah, take it away. The track climbed a hillside as Paran followed it. At the top, he rears his horse to a stop. He leaned back in his saddle and unsheathed his sword. He saw an armored man next to a small campfire get up and leans on his bastard sword for stability. This man regards Paran. Paran nudged his mount forward. Scanning the surrounding area, the armored man appeared to be alone. The man told Paran that if he's... That he... Is, or that if he's in no shape for a fight, but if Paran wanted one, he could have it. Paran replies by saying that he's in no mood for a fight. Paran then makes a joke about the mule the armored van is with. The armored van barks a laugh and tells Paran that he has food to spare, and if Paran would like to join him, he could. The captain dismounts and introduces himself and then sits by the fire. Call sits down and introduces himself. Call asks Paran if he's down from the north. Paran tells him that he came from the Genabaris, from Genabaris initially and spent some time in Pale. A little late to the party, but enough to believe the stories around Pale. He tells Call that he heard that Moonspawn is over Darudistan. Call tells Paran that it is indeed. Stirring the fire, Call tells Paran that there is stew in the pot and he's welcome to it. Paran realizes he's famished and digs in. Silence ensued while Paran ate. Finishing, Call asks if Paran is heading to Jerusalem, which Paran says that he is. Paran, noticing the sun setting, asks Call if he could share the camp that night. Call says that he is welcome to do so. Paran, while packing up his horse, tells Call that he can help with his problem telling Call that he'll ride in with him and Call can use Paran's pack horse. Seeing the suspicion in Call's eyes, Paran goes on explaining that his horses could use a day's rest. And being that he's never been to Darugistan, and all he asks is to allow Paran to ask Call questions. Call warns Paran that he's not much of a talker. Paran tells Call that he's a deserter of the Malazan army, Among other things pertaining to his story, Call with a breath tells Paran about his story. That he was once noble-born, the last of a long-lined family, 
telling Paran that he was arranged for marriage, but he had fallen in love with another woman. He continues to tell Paran of his downfall from nobility. Paran, being able to re- relate to Call's story, tells Call that he himself was once noble too. Explaining to Call that the noble in Malaz had met their match by the emperor cowering like dogs. Paran deduces this to be an issue of power. He tells Call that he looks back on that and it isn't a life at all. And since he'd severed all his privileges of noble blood, he has never felt more alive. Call, admitting to Paran that he's not the smartest man, but if he understands Paran, his betrayal to himself, whatever it was back then, it wasn't life. Call admits that he wants it back. Paran couldn't help but laugh at hearing this. Call, after some time, joined in on the giggling fit as well. Call, through laughter, tells Paran that he appreciates him coming out of the blue like this. He also tells Paran that there's Worrytown wine that is vintage in a sack and that it's running out of time. I like this interaction. What did you think? Yeah, I liked it too. Uh, you know, Call, Call, he gets a little bit more, I guess, interesting. He, right. Yeah, there's definitely some depth. We get more depth to Call, right? Like before he was just this drunk bystander, but now we like, we can understand why some of even Ralik's motivations to essentially kill kill Simitel, right? But then his mind was changed suddenly, quote unquote, I would say by the coin um, dropping, which I think now that I've read on looking back at that situation, like, I think his mind changed because he started to think about protecting Crocus in some way, shape, or form. I could be wrong about that, which is why he shot the council member, Lim, I think is what it's called, or what his name was. That sounds correct from what I remember. So, yeah, it's just... I guess the one big thing that like I'm taking away from this section... Actually, there's two things. Uh, but the, the big thing that I'm taking away from this is the uh, nobility part. And that is, as far as, like, calls... Because, like, in this section, and again, I didn't summarize it adequately because it was already starting to turn into a long, a long summary. But this, this section is probably about three pages long. And all it is is just these dudes sitting by a campfire telling each other their stories. In essence, is is what I could have summar like summarized it as. But Cole Cole admits that he could have done something about him being overthrown from his nobility, his name stripped. Um, you know, apparently he's the last son of a long lined like family no like a noble family in Jerujistan and like to have his name stripped all because he decided not to go with the arranged marriage but rather this whore Simitel using her vagina to manipulate council members or whoever his friends were to help her overthrow Call's name essentially and he regrets it he regrets it again, going back to like the epigraph thing. And I think what was so beautiful is Paran kind of coming in, sharing the fact that like he was noble as well, like noble blood as well. And telling how call, how he left his noble blood and all of the privileges to go join the Malazan army. And taking his experiences now and his experiences back then, he's telling Call that that wasn't life. This is life right now. So I thought it was beautiful how, like, Call, while he admits he's not the most smartest of men, he understands what Paran is trying to say and that him regretting not doing anything about being overthrown 
wasn't life. It wasn't living. But what he's doing now is. Which I thought was like, fuck, ooh, mind blown. This is deep. Yeah, super deep. And then lastly, now this is, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like this is, nobility hasn't really come up for a long time until now. Like, do you remember everything, not everything, but do you remember like nobility being talked about in the prologue? Yeah, a little bit. And I feel like there was something there with nobility. And I feel like it isn't until now that we kind of get that answer. And it sounds like the old emperor had an issue with nobility and abused his power to weed them out or exercise them or whatever the case is, you know? I could be very wrong on that, but that's just kind of the sense that I get. It just, the nobility talk between Call and Paran just triggered something about that prologue. Like, I'm kind of tempted to go back and listen to that first episode again. As terribly recorded as that was. <laughs> hey, we've come a long ways. Yeah, we have. I just, I kind of wonder, you know, they, that, Krupp sniffed up this plan, you know, to put Call back to his place. But what is, you know, if he gets put back to his station, what is it, what's to gain from that? I don't know. I mean, I guess I can only imagine it's like, it's like winning millions in the lottery, right? And then a year later, it's all gone. You know, that feeling of like, regret and dread of wasting you know what i mean like i can i can understand or empathize where where call is coming from but at the same time i'm i love like that paran is is kind of doing him a favor mentally like hey like that wasn't life before this is which may help him with his drinking maybe this is the re excuse me, the reason why he drinks. But, yeah. I mean, I guess you'd, you'd probably want to forget getting screwed over. Right. Yeah, I think screwed over is an understatement. Like, it sounds like <laughs> yeah. he got fucked by somebody that, you know, he supposedly fell in love with, you know? Like, how tragic is that? Again, going back to the December thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's shitty. <laughs> So I can only imagine, you know, obviously Call would tell this to Ralic and Marilio and, and Crocus and Crop. So I can see Ralic kind of like trying to avenge avenge that because Call is he's broken. He's a broken man. He's yeah, he's about as broken as he can get. But yeah, I guess those were like the two big things that that I had in mind when I read the section or while I was reading the section. But I just like the mix of, of, you know, kind of like wind down the, like comparatively to the last chapter, it was definitely a lot more chill, but there's still a lot of things that were happening. Oh yeah, definitely. Quite. Yeah. I mean, there was, there was some action, not as much maybe, but you know, plenty happened it it was it's not like it was a struggle to get through it i agree i'm glad that i get to itch and uh read on <laughs> get to scratch the itch yeah i think this next chapter is about 20 ish pages again uh so that we will be uh the city of blue fire right yep chapter 17 and then that ends at 498. So, yeah, we're at, yeah, what'd you say, 180 ish pages or so, somewhere in there? Yeah. Less than 200. Yeah. I think it'll go pretty quick. I think so too. I think so too. Before we know it, we'll be 100 pages away. And then we'll, we'll wrap up Gardens of the Moon. And I will anxiously wait to start Dead House Gates. Yeah. Yeah. I, 
I don't know if we'll, I mean, I guess I don't know. Do you think you're going to want to like a break in between? I don't, I don't know. I think we could probably just roll right into it. I hadn't really given it much thought, but I didn't know if you had. I haven't given it much thought either. I, I know that you wanted to do your Vasquez. Um, so I thought, I thought, I, I guess I just planned on doing that as like an intermission, but I'm cool with keeping yeah. it on. I would say just, yeah, we keep going. And I mean, I don't know. I feel like based on the, you know, the communities, whether that's YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, uh, regarding this, I, I can't say that I've gotten any type of bad feedback on the content. If anything, I'm, we're getting, I'm getting a lot of, you know, Hey, I never thought of it that way type of stuff. So, and if this to the community is the worst book, like I can only imagine that the level of detail that we go into the other books is going to be just as good. Oh yeah. I'm, I'm sure it's going to be. And I mean, I, I know you and I have both heard that this next book is, you know, a fan fave. So I, I'm really excited to start it. I want to get there like yesterday. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I wanted to get there probably about two weeks after I started reading this Gardens of the Moon because <laughs> it's roughly the average time it takes me to finish a book this size, about two, two, three weeks. But, you know, as we have mentioned, it's, I guess this is the spirit of our podcast, right? This is essentially the core is just an understanding of the chapter as we go through it, not, on, on not realizing anything that takes place before then you know so right hopefully you know to be act as a, a guide to those who are struggling with this book and this series who want to follow along and kind of dive into it the way that we're diving into it or people who have read the series already who just kind of want to like go back and maybe reminisce a little bit or hear another perspective i mean i, I feel like what we offer is is quite a bit so I appreciate the community giving us some encouragement. Yeah. And our, our, I mean, I, I know we're both trying to grow our community that we have and uh, we're up to 110 Twitter followers now. Um, well, I think we're right around the 1400 listens mark. Yep. On both uh, uh, for the show, which is pretty freaking cool. That exciting. Is, yeah. Um, and just getting to interact with everybody. One thing that I've, I've been meaning to do and have kind of forgotten here, but, um, uh, when my wife's dad died and we had a, uh, GoFundMe going, um, I posted it on our Twitter and we got an, an anonymous $50 donation. Um, I'd have to think it's somebody that follows us on Twitter. I don't, you know, it's anonymous. I don't have a clue who it was, but if it's uh, somebody who's listening, I, I, I just, I'm sorry I didn't do this sooner and, and thank you. Uh, but here is, it is now. So thank you for that. Um, everything helped. So I, I don't want that person to feel unappreciated or anything. It was very much appreciated. That's a good call out. <laughs> yeah. I didn't mean to kind of go down a down there, but. It's all good. Um, I guess, uh, as far as YouTube, all of our episodes are available on there now. Um, so yeah, I guess we'll see you. We'll see the audience where we see them, whether that's YouTube, Anchor, Spotify, Google podcasts, Apple podcasts, we're out there. We are out there and yeah, next week we will, uh, start the city of blue fire. Looking forward to it. Me as well, sir. Well, any, anything else? Any final thoughts here? No, not at all. I think that uh, I'm satisfied with concluding. All right, man. Well, have a good night. We'll talk. Uh, we'll talk soon. All right, later, man. See ya.